All right, a lot of folks will trickle in, but um, to respect your time, we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, sure. Thank you guys for coming to our Rural EMS Education Series. Um, we are so fortunate to have Dr. Michael Cripps here. I'm gonna do a brief intro. I'll try to keep it brief because he's done a lot of things that he can talk about. But uh, briefly, Dr. Cripps is the section chief for the Trauma Acute Care Surgery at the University of Colorado. Um, he's the Trauma Medical Director at the Anschutz Medical Campus. Um, he did a lot of training, some of it in Texas, some of it in San Francisco, actually went to school across the street from where I went to medical school, which I just found out. Um, and uh, he does a lot of research, has a lot of specialty, uh, but we were lucky to steal him from Parkland, um, which is in UT Southwestern in Dallas a couple years ago. And um, I'm so excited to hear this talk. So without further ado, I will uh, hush and let you take it away. Oh, well, thank you very much. That's a very uh, kind introduction. Uh, like Dr. Parker said, <clears throat> I, uh, I'm originally from Texas uh, and then uh, did my <clears throat> med school in Houston and my residency in Oakland, California, and then San Francisco, uh, and then back to Dallas, uh, where I was at Parkland, uh, which I spent uh, the next of uh, the first 10 years of my career there. Uh, and then from there, uh, came out here to uh, be the section chief and TMD at the university. So I could be more excited to be out here. Uh, it's a phenomenal place to, uh, to work and uh, uh, be a member of. So uh, I'll spend a little bit of time uh, talking about rural, or spend some time talking about rural trauma support and a little bit of time talking about Roboa, as that's a question that will frequently come up in here. Um, I, we can do this all the ways. I'm just going to start talking, go through slides. If you have something that pops up, you have a question about, just feel free to, to pipe in and start asking, um, or you wait to the end. Either way, it's fine by me, doesn't really matter. Uh, so disclosures, I uh, like I said, I do a lot of research. These are a couple of coagulation uh, folks that I've done research for in the past, but it won't affect today's talk. And so what I wanna be able to, to accomplish today at the end of this talk is to to discuss and think about resuscitation, far forward echelons, and then and then transfer considerations. And then also talk, like I said, a little bit about Reboa and see if we can recognize who we think might be a uh, benefit from it and some of the technical aspects and the risks associated with that uh, technology. Um, really though, what, you know, that's kind of what I always put out there in the learning objectives. Really what we're gonna talk about is that all critically injured patients need a very thoughtful resuscitated conduct regardless of where that person is. And that Rebo is a tool that can be used, but the first point should always be the priority, thoughtful resuscitative conduct. So uh, yeah, I went through that uh, introduction about where I was again, just to, cause I know a lot of people are like, well, hold on a second with that background, is Cripps really a rural trauma surgeon? And the answer is like, nope, not even close. Uh, I work at uh, the University of Colorado Anschutz Medical Center. Uh, we had Aurora, as most of y'all know, has a population of about 400,000 uh, and, and steadily increasing every year. Uh, as you can see, it's about uh, 2,500 people per square mile. Uh, and we abut the Denver metro area, which has about 3 million people. Uh, before I came here, like I said, I spent 10 years at Parkland uh, Memorial Hospital. Uh, there, while I was there, I served as the TMD, the, the, the certified IC director and the disaster medical director. That's this giant monstrosity sewing machine looking building out here. Uh, that is a real picture. That's how big it is. It's a $1 billion county hospital. Uh, the emergency medicine department sees about 250,000 patients per year. It's the busiest emergency medicine department in the country. Uh, to put that in perspective, uh, Anschutz sees probably about 100,000 uh, per year. Uh, the trauma service saw about 10,000 patients uh, per year. And we serve the Dallas metro area about six and a half million people. Uh, so clearly not really uh, a rural trauma area. Uh, as we said, I did my fellowship at San Francisco General Hospital. Uh, this little patch of green right here is probably about the only rural area in the whole place. Uh, so if you want to consider that, and you can't see them here, but this is just chock full of uh, homeless people living there. Uh, and this is the hospital. So we got a lot of trauma, real quick, real rapid transport. And this is Highland Hospital where I did my residency. Uh, and this is probably about the only green patch there. And that didn't even exist when I was a resident. So 
what would I know about rural trial from residency in Oakland, a fellowship in San Francisco, not much at all. Uh, but what about my non-political knowledge of rural areas? So this is where I grew up, right? There's a red dot. This is Stephenville, Texas, right? Smack dab in the center of Texas. Uh, to get there from here, you would walk uh, east till you smell it and then south until you step in it. It's just a big old cow town area. Uh, this is the downtown square where I grew up. And if you look right down here, you will see we do indeed have a statue of a cow in our town square. Uh, and I lived... Uh, somewhere right about there on the horizon. So I grew up in a very rural area and I am very familiar with what happens to folks when they have traumatic uh, events in that area and uh, the problems that can occur uh, when that happens because you just are in an austere environment. So let's go back to uh, when I finished residency, Oakland uh, Fellowship at San Francisco, Joel of Parkland, uh, come to find out not only does it serve Dallas metro area, but it has a very, very large catchment area all the way up to Oklahoma, West Texas. Uh, and most of that area is actually rural. And so uh, if we were live, this is where I'd ask the question, if anybody uh, happens to know who this guy is, this is one of my very, very first cases as an attending. Anybody happen to know? This is Jackie Bibby. And if you were to Google him, he holds the world record, multiple uh, world records for rattlesnake wrangling including, as you can see here, holding the most number of rattlesnakes in his mouth at one time. Uh, I think there was like sleeping bag, probably the sleeping bag with the most number of rattlesnakes getting in the bathtub. Well, as you might imagine, uh, eventually that guy gets bitten. Uh, and he had bitten so many times that the crow fab actually stopped working. Uh, and he got something about 42 vials. So I ended up having to do an amputation uh, on his leg here. But when I first got the consult for somebody at the rattlesnake bite, I was like, well, where I grew up, I think you're supposed to cut the skin open, suck the venom out and spit it or something like that. So obviously not something you do in the hospital and actually uh, against real medical uh, treatment for this. So learn quickly that uh, my training is great as it had been, uh, you know, handling, you know, five, six gunshot wounds at a time. Was it going to prepare me for this type of injuries? Uh, next question I usually ask people is who knows what this is? Uh yeah, that's a grain auger. Well, where I grew up, we call them grain elevators. And so I'm on call one night and I get uh, a call from the operator says there's a husband and wife who are working on a grain auger and she got her arm stuck in it, got tangled up. It comes out mangled while he was trying to help get her out. He got caught up in it and he had some major lacerations to his abdomen and his arm as well. And I just remember thinking like, what, what the hell is a, what's an auger? And then come to find, I'm like, oh, you meant elevator. So not only did I have a real trauma uh, issue that I hadn't really done training with, I apparently had a vocabulary issue that I was going to have to overcome as well. And then uh, round, by the way, this is all within the first few months of me being an attending, having all these. Uh, and this is down, this is the West Fertilizer Plant down in West Texas. I don't know if any of y'all remember uh, <clears throat> this fertilizer plant. There was some uh, violations of their safety protocols. And led to an explosion. Uh, this is what it looked like. So we started getting, I was on call and we got a phone call. There had been a massive explosion. Uh, and unfortunately, it the fire started first. And so there was a lot of actually first responders that were on scene uh, when this explosion happened. So we had uh, fatalities and significant injuries, combination, penetrating, blunt penetrating, burn, blunt penetrating. Uh, and so several of them being sent out from uh, West, the city of West Texas. So, and over the, the next decade, I spent many, many call nights talking with surgeons and physicians in rural Texas, uh, dealing with injured patients. And, and what I figured out at that point is that, you know, all trauma is local. They, you can't try to learn and figure out what type of trauma you can expect to see in these areas. It's just, it's fascinatingly different uh, and comes in all shapes for, uh, and forms. So, this is really where it kind of piqued my interest uh, in rural trauma and how we can best care for those patients. And really what I kind of came back to during that time frame was that just go fall back to the basics, right? The ABCs of trauma. And when we think about that, airway and breathing are clearly the number one and two things we got to think about because when if those are a big problem, the patient's going to die very quickly. However, once those are handled, it typically doesn't become a problem anymore. 
right? So once the airway is secure, once the chest tube is placed, unless something happens to yank out those tubes, that's taken care of. And so circulation really does become the big problem here when we're trans when we're dealing with these patients. We're out in an austere environment, uh, and uh, we got patients with ongoing hemorrhage. How are we going to handle that? Uh, we know we're supposed to give this hemostatic resuscitation, but what does that mean? What do you give? How do you give it? When? Uh, what do you have available to you? Uh, how long is it going to take you to get to your definitive transport? How much fluid do you have to have? Is there anything else you should do? So this is going to be the real crux of my talk for rural trauma, because I really do think it is the critical, important component of rural trauma uh, uh, treatment. So how do we resuscitate? Well, when we talk about what to give, we got all sorts of stuff. We got the crystalloids or standard uh, uh, sodium, uh, normal saline, which by the way is not normal. Uh, we got your lactator ringers, p light uh, is another one. Got your different blood components, uh, packed red cells, plasma, platelets, cryo, uh, whole blood is making its uh, reemergence onto the scene, as, as it were. These days, we have lots of pharmacologic adjuncts. We got TXA, PCC, Restaf, which is fibrinogen concentrate. Uh, we have different ways of measuring patients' blood coagulation. We've got Rotems and TEGS. Uh, there's, they're not really out there yet, but they're getting pretty close to being like backpack style. So those are options. We got Reboz, Combat Gods. Uh, we got tourniquets. So we got a lot of these things to start like, oh my gosh, what are we going to do when we're, we're dealing with these patients? So the next time this come up, the question will come up is, well, when should we get it? Should we do all this other stuff in the uh, field? Should we stay in place? Should we just book them and run? You know, should we wait till we get to the recess room? Uh, should I wait till we get up to the OR and not muck around down in the recess room? You know, how, when should we do that? All right, here's my answer to those questions. You've got to keep it simple. Stop the bleeding as soon as you can and then get to the hospital. All right, so when I say stop the bleeding, I think we should use all the tools at our disposal. So that's going to differ on where you are and what you have available to you, but whatever it is you happen to have, I say you should use it and you should use it as fast and as early as you can. So probably right now uh, and today, the most common one of these adjuncts is going to be your tourniquet and combat gauze. Uh, you know, I'm old enough to uh, remember when I was an uh, intern, we saw a lot of patients coming in without tourniquets. You know, back then, that was what, uh, you know, uh, 2003, uh, there was still a lot of people out there thinking that tourniquets caused limb loss, nerve damage, ischemia, and stuff like that. Um in my intern year, a lot of uh, former military PJs who rotated back from Iraq uh, were becoming EMS paramedics and showing up with, and patients were showing up with tourniquets. And that would first start like, oh, hold on a second. Uh, we think these patients are actually doing better. And so uh, this is uh, Juan Duchesne's uh, study looking at um, civilian use of pre-hospital tourniquet use. And it was a multi-center uh, study looking at nine different trauma centers. Uh, what they found was that there was a significant decrease in the mortality in those who had pre-hospital tourniquet places. And fascinating, interestingly enough, the amputation rate was significantly lower. So we really debunked a lot of those old myths about tourniquet placements and uh, increasing risk of complications. Uh, this was followed up by uh, another uh, systematic review of the literature looking at tourniquet use in pre hospital arena. Pretty much said exactly the same thing that the mortality was lower, the, the rate of uh, compartment syndromes and nerve deficits or infections after that were actually really quite low. So, really said, brought in the air of like, yes, please do in the pre hospital arena apply the tourniquets. Uh, the other component of that is the hemostatic gauze. I went through a few iterations, and if any of you all remember, like the early uh, iteration that they had to pause and read back because it caused some uh, exothermic reactions and some local uh, burns. So they reformulated it, impregnated the gauze, uh, and there's since that, that time frame, there hasn't been any problems. So there's lots of different kinds of hemostatic gauze out there with it. You know, they're all proprietary. Some of them use kaolin, ketosin, some use TXA, some use thrombin. Again, my personal opinion on that is it doesn't really matter, but just have one and apply it. Uh, and the combination of these two is what comprises the uh, Stop the Bleed campaign that many of you are probably familiar with. Uh, just to show that this isn't just 
some concept like do we think do we just think it works no peter reed looked at it um and quit colliding in multiple different venues uh military uh civilian trauma surgeons and first responders and found that there's a 92 percent uh, overall effectiveness uh in use of it and it was 100 percent first responder so uh absolutely easy use should be used uh there's a lot of other adjuncts out there that i like uh, some people have access to them in the pre-hospital arena, some don't. Uh, for, you know, femur fractures where you show up and the patient's, you know, left leg is a half foot or a foot shorter than the right leg, and it's, you know, significantly rotated, twisted in the wrong direction, you know they have a femur fracture in that area. Um, it's important to remember that patients can lose their entire, pretty much their entire blood supply into their thigh. So it's really important when you have those patients uh, with those bad femur fractures to pull that femur to length. Uh, it does a few things when you do that. It takes that compartment from being really big where it can soak up a lot of the blood, compresses that uh, femur down, uh, that, that compartment down to decrease the blood loss. And also uh, that the femoral artery in there can get kinked up whenever that leg's uh, shortened like that. So it does help pull it to length. It does help with the blood supply distal. Uh, other adjunct pelvic fractures. So I, I've started saying this, uh, I don't know, maybe a few years ago that I think pelvic binders are today as what tourniquets were 20 years ago. So like 20 years ago, not everybody believed that tourniquets should be applied uh, in patients that they thought were at risk for extremity hemorrhage. Uh, some people today don't think pelvic binders should be applied to people at risk for pelvic hemorrhage. I disagree. I think they should be placed. I think if you have them, available to you uh, and you go through a very quite simple training to learn where the greater trochanter is and how to appropriately pace a uh, binder on the greater trochanter, then I think it should be done uh, pre-hospital. And actually, pretty much I tell anybody that in the pre-hospital realm uh, that if you have binders available to you and you place one on the pre-hospital uh, scene and you show up in any physician gives you grief uh, over doing that, uh, I will give you my cell phone number uh, at the end of this and you can call me and I will go find that physician and you will not get grief for it anymore. Uh, because I do think that this is important and, and it's something that we can do to save lives. Pelvic fractures have a mortality rate of 30% and that unfortunately really hasn't changed in the last couple of decades. So it really is a significant thing. And I bet you dollars to donuts in 20 years, people will be shocked that you ever worked in a time frame where you didn't have pelvic binders available to you. Uh, Reboa is a very, very common and I would say hotly debated topic uh, about its use. Uh, uh, for those of you who don't know what Reboa is, it's a, re a resuscitative endovascular balloon occlusion of the aorta. Uh, this catheter here is placed up uh, through the uh, femoral artery into the aorta and a balloon is uh, inflated to occlude the aorta and prevent distal uh, hemorrhage. Um, these things are quite expensive and it does require an invasive therapy and it does require some uh, significant training, uh, but it, uh, it is talked about a lot. Um, and when I get to the end, I'll, uh, I don't have the slides for it, but I'll give you some new data that's uh, been reported but not published yet. All right, so. Let's say you have some of these uh, uh, modalities available to you. Uh, you've started to stem your hemorrhage best you can. You're uh, now on your route to the hospital. Now you got to get your fluid resuscitation. So I see this all the time. Somebody comes in, they're bleeding. Um, and the first gestalt people have to start just dumping fluids in. Like, oh my God, they're bleeding. Their blood pressure is 90. We got to get some fluid. I'm like, oh my God, quick, quick, quick. And, and I get it and I understand it. Um, and sometimes that can be the right thing to do. However, there is this concept that we should be aware of, of damage control resuscitation. The first component of that is what we call no low and slow. You, loom, you give no crystalloids, you give uh, low volume of blood and you give it slowly. Now, what, where would that ever come from? Well, this is where I talk about for damage control resuscitation, there's three components. Focus on hemorrhage control. That's all the adjuncts just got talked about. Permissive of hypotension, hypovolemia, and the uh, prevention and correction of trauma-induced coagulopathy. 
And what I say is when you're trying to do permissive hypotension, hypovolemia, this is the hole in the bucket concept. If you got a bunch of holes in this bucket and you're pouring more and more fluids in there until you do something to plug up these holes, it doesn't matter what you're pouring in there. It's going to keep coming out. As a matter of fact, the more you try to push it, the more it's going to come out. Um, and so these things, while it does say they sort of go in this order, in reality, the resuscitation and hemorrhage control proceed at the same time and they work together. So I'll go through each one. I've already talked about the hemorrhage control. So I'll go in a little bit more detail here about the permissive hypertension and coagulopathy. So permissive hypertension, I get it. It is probably one of the hardest things to pragmatically do when you're resuscitating a trauma patient. And what you're really doing is you're going to temporarily prioritize your hemostasis over perfusion. The aim is to just perfuse the brain and the heart. And restoration of a normal blood pressure is not the goal. I see interns doing this all the time. Like, I'm giving blood. I can't get the blood pressure up over 110. I'm like, I know. Stop. It's not going to until we stop the bleeding. So your number one goal and thought process should always be, hey, am I doing what I can to stop the bleeding? And then let's get some resuscitation. In. Well, where's, I uh, don't know if I go into this on this one. Yeah, I'll, I'll tell you what the number is in a minute. So people like, when I tell them this, like, holy smokes, that sounds dangerous. I don't know if I'm comfortable, like not trying to push people's blood pressure as high as I can get it. Well, it's actually been looked at. Uh, there's multiple retrospective studies have been doing this. They all in some shape, form, or fashion, so a survival benefit or decreased complications. Five prospective randomized control trials doing uh, target goal, target uh, normal resuscitation or hypotensive resuscitation. Uh, one showed improved survival for all those that got hypotensive. Another one showed survival in post hoc just for the blunt traumas in the hypotensive. And one showed decreased AKI and short length of stay for the hypertensive. But most importantly, none of those showed harm in those who got hypotensive, had, who had a hypertensive resuscitation uh, conduct. Um, what about if the patient has a TBI? Uh, you know, because you, you should always try to avoid hypotension patients that have TBI. Um, generally speaking, these patients have a much poor prognosis to begin with. So it's made doing trials on these folks very, very difficult. So really, my advice is when you have these patients is focus on your primary issue. If you think your primary issue is hemorrhage, target systolic of 80 to 90. Anybody who's in the military or worked at JSOC or just TCCC, they will talk about titrating to a palpable radial pulse. Pretty reasonable thing to do. If you can't feel a radial pulse, get more fluid. So you start to feel it, you can start slowing down. And that's about where you go. You know, if it goes up to 100, 110, like, great, slow down. If it's down in 70s, give them some more. And that's just typically the way I look at it. If you think that the patient has primary issues of bad TBI, but might have some hemorrhage, you probably do need to keep that pressure up a little bit higher. And I get it, it's tricky. Do the best you can. Um, but these are where some of these concepts are going to be coming from. So that's why if you see us, you see me in the resuscitation band, they're like, hey, their systolic's 90. And I know that they say I've got a gunshot wound in the abdomen. I'm like, great. Slow the blood down, let's go to the OR. People are like, what? Well, that's where this is coming from. Okay, prevention and treatment of coagulopathy. So this is where it's gonna get super nerdy for just a minute, but if you just hold with me, uh, it's the journey that's important. Okay, so lots of us somewhere in college have seen like, hey, here's a coagulation cascade. Well, that's stupid, that's not what it looks like. It really looks something more like this. And this is probably just the you know tip of the iceberg. It looks like the flight pattern out of DIA. It's a correlation. It's a very, very complex interactome with coagulation and inflammation. Um, traditionally, when we talk about coagulopathy, a lot of people, this is the concept they have in it, which is, hey, we lose all of our coagulation factors through the hemorrhage. Um, and we're just chewing up as much of it as we can to try to make clots to seal up what's causing the hemorrhage. And then we give them a lot of non-factor containing fluids like crystalloids or packed red cells that don't have any clotting materials. And that's where this coagulopathy comes from. And in part, that is true. Uh, this is not an uncommon sight uh, in the OR when we're dealing with these folks who have really, really bad hemorrhage. And if it's super bad, it can end up looking like this. Um, it, it, they're just bleeding Kool-Aid. Uh, and when this starts to happen, I can tell you the mortality rate on these folks is over about 75, 80%. 
Um, some, some studies put it at 100%. Um, uh, back in 2003, uh, Karen Brody, when he was at San Francisco General, and that's why I made a point to say like, hey, here's the hospital and here's this really sort of bad part of town. And these patients are being transferred, uh, transported to this hospital. Most of these patients we picked up, brought to the hospital with a transport time of about 30 seconds. Uh, and so there's no IV, there's no fluid going, there's no access whatsoever. They bring them in. And uh, Carol Brogy noticed like, hey man, it's really interesting. A lot of these folks have a quite, like their INR is elevated when they got here. Like, and they didn't get in resuscitation. They ended like nothing happened other than the injury. And what he found out was that the more severely injured a patient was, the more likely they were to have a coagulopathy. Uh, and then further, and that's on this slide, to about somewhere about 30% uh, of patients showed up with a coagulopathy. And if they had a coagulopathy, the more severely injured they were, they had a linear stepwise increase in the mortality. I mean, more severely injured plus coagulopathic, higher mortality rate. Uh, Mitch Cohen, who also, uh, he was my mentor when I was a fellow at San Francisco, who actually now works at Aurora uh, with us at Anschutz Medical Center. Uh, went through and looked at is like he found out through a series of experiments that it really is a combination of hemorrhagic shock and tissue damage that causes this coagulopathy. So if you just had like my cut your superficial femoral artery and you're hemorrhaging, that might cause a coagulopathy. It's a short, it's a small percentage of them. Um, if I take a baseball bat and smash your liver with the blunt trauma, yeah, some of that might be cause of coagulopathy. But if I do both of those things to you, that really is an indicator of a patient that's going to have a coagulopathy. And we really saw this being played out in the military, where we see a lot of these war fighters have combination blunt and penetrating injuries with massive hemorrhage and massive tissue damage. And they almost all had this coagulopathy present, regardless of the resuscitation that was given to them. And then we saw this too in the civilian area. This is a picture I took at, at San Francisco and somebody got run over by the trolley car and got their leg just crushed off. And you know these patients, so this is exactly what we're talking about. Uh, massive tissue damage, massive hemorrhage. They'll develop this intrinsic coagulopathy. Uh, and so Mitch went through this and actually ensued through some really elegant uh, biochemical experiments, was able to identify a pathway a biochemical pathway intrinsic that causes this kickover of the coagulopathy. Uh, and then the uh, folks over at Denver Health looked at this and said, man, this is, you know, it's fascinating. Like we see this group of patients that are having this high kickover of this coagulopathy, a sub portion of what's called is called hyperfibrinolysis means uh, fibrin is what, you know, is part of the clot. You know, everybody breaks down their clot. Like if you skin your knee, you know, you want to you want to make a clot because you want to stop that bleeding, but you also want that clot to stop being made. You don't want it to propagate all the way up, give you a mass P and die. We won't have any humans left. So there is a process that stops that clot, and then you want that clot to go away after a while so it will dissolve on its own, right? So the body has this capability. Well, what Mitch showed is that there's this process where that stuff kicks over super fast and goes hyper fast. So that's why it's called hyperfibrinolysis, faster clot breakdown than it's supposed to be. That's what causes that Kool-Aid looking. Folks over at Denver said, hey man, it's fascinating. Like, you know, if there's a hyper and there's a normal, there ought to be, I wonder if there's a hypo. And sure enough, there is. So, you know, this complex machinery that's causing our clot inside of us after an injury, if it's too high over here, it'll kill you. If it's too low, it'll kill you. This is from hemorrhage, and this is probably from the multiple organ uh, shutdown and sepsis that we see later on in the ICU. So since this time frame, there have been multiple, multiple studies here that have showed that there's an intrinsic pathway that doesn't have anything to do with what we do to them and how we resuscitate them that's going to kick over their coagulation cascade and cause a real severe problem inside that patient. Now we have to consider this. So... That's how I go through the whole long nerd diatribe right there to get to this point, which is you got to stop the bleeding, right? The first part is really important. And that's why. So this is the why behind the what. Like we get it. Yeah. Hey, you're going to lose some volume and blood, but we got to stop that bleeding because the more it bleeds, tissue damage and hemorrhage, it's going to mess up that person's ability to make clot and really kick over some problems. So 
how we treat this coagulopathy, stop the bleeding, and then we want to restore their circulatory volume. And, you know, we've all, I've seen thousands and thousands of bleeding patients. Nobody's ever come in like, holy smokes, look at all the saline that's coming out of me. Like, no, we bleed whole blood. So we should probably give them whole blood back. Um, and so we can either do it through an amalgam of whole blood, meaning packed red cells, FFP and platelets and an equal ratio of some of the whole blood. And also we have some of these new adjuncts now that we can add to that. So where does the data come from that? So this is John Holcomb's big $50 million study looking at one to one versus one to two. The, one, the last number is red cells, uh, excuse me. Yeah, red cells, two red cells per an FFP or one red cell per an FFP. Looking at 24 day uh, or 24 hour and 30 day all cause mortality and a lot of secondary outcomes uh, listed here. So what they found is that at one to one versus one to two, there was no difference in mortality either at 24 hours or 30 days. Um, however, the patients that got, you know, more equal, meaning one to one ratio, had uh, more of those patients were became hemostatic, fewer had exsanguination as a cause of death, and in 23 different measured post-resuscitation complications, there was no difference. So this really started to drive from using uh, one to one uh, resuscitation. Uh, and then whole blood has come back on the, uh, the scene. And I say that because it's been multiple, whole blood has been used multiple times over the course of history. And we keep relearning its value. As you might imagine, when we first were able to take blood out of people and give it to another person with just some minor blood typing, we didn't really have the great ability to separate the components. So that's what was used. Uh, and then in the Battle of Mogadishu, this is the October 3-4 uh, Battle of 1993. This is the Black Hawk Down uh, movie scenario. Uh, many people don't know John Holcomb, uh, who uh, the aforementioned author of that large study, was the trauma surgeon uh, deployed there uh, on base at the time. And interestingly, the only one uh, who was there uh, at the time. Uh, and what they ended up having to do because they quickly out um, just used up their blood bank because they set up a essentially a sidewalk blood bank and having soldiers who weren't there uh, or injured uh, coming over and donating blood and being uh, who were because they know their, their their blood type and pretty much doing warm blood whole whole blood transfusions and John said the difference in those who got that versus the component was just palpable and so this really started pushing the strike for whole blood again um, and there's a lot of different studies on it. Um, Phil Spinella, um, Brian Cotton. Uh, this one uh, came out, uh, when was this? Last year in April. This is a prospective observational 840 whole blood versus 537 component and whole blood associated improved survival and decreased blood use. Um, there was another paper that just came out um, uh, in JAXA. Uh, that was a uh, randomized, uh, no, it was a prospective observational study of whole blood. It didn't show any difference in survival. Uh, when you go through and you look at the study on that, because of how it was set up as a prospective observational, uh, what it turns out is that most patients either got straight component therapy or just two units of whole blood and then component therapy. So it isn't really a whole blood versus a component therapy trial. It's a two unit of whole blood plus component versus component. And so I wasn't very surprised to see that there wasn't a lot of difference uh, in those patients. And actually some of the patients got whole blood did worse, which makes sense because if you look at like, hey, if I'm on call and someone comes in really, really sick, I'm gonna try to get them whole blood first. And so it's not surprising that there is a uh, survivor bias issue going on there because those are folks are more likely to die. Um, next question is when should we give it can we do this in the pre-hospital arena as well like our hemorrhage control and the answer to that question is yes with an asterisk so um, when we look at uh, Brian Kim's study here at uh, pre-hospital plasma uh, they looked at 59 patients uh, in aeromedical so uh, those coming in the helo getting plasma found a significant improvement in their coagulation, which we talked about as an important thing to treat. Uh, Jason Sperry uh, did this, um, was called the PAMPER trials of pre-hospital plasma during air medical. Uh, 500 patients, uh, 230 in plasma, 270 in standard, 
Uh, and what they found is that those who got plasma in the pre-hospital arena did significantly better in their mortality uh, and in their um, uh, coagulation, most likely. Uh, furthermore, there was no significant differences in any of the complications as they measured there, multiple failure, multiple organ failure, uh, AI infections, or any transfusion-related reactions. Uh, the Denver uh, Health Group looked at uh, plasma first resuscitation and ground transport uh, in about 120 patients, very short transport times, and, and did not find any difference in the uh, outcomes that were uh, measured, which was interesting. Um, Frank Guyat uh, looked at pre-hospital low titer old, whole blood in a um, uh, single center prospective uh, pre-hospital uh, through in post, uh, hospital, meaning they just well, they measured them pre-hospital and then watched them all the way through. Um, saw no differences in outcomes or complications uh, in whole blood there. So uh, what I'll say about the pre-hospital transfusion is that right now the data appears to suggest that for long transport times, meaning those who are typically coming in the aeromedical, that's where we see the most benefit. Uh, for ground transportation, which are typically shorter transport times, we're not seeing a, a large di uh, difference uh, in resuscitation benefit there, uh, which probably just has to do with the amount of time, the amount of volume that's given to those patients during that time frame. So uh, still not sure about tra ground transport, uh, aeromedical transport. I am in favor of using pre-hospital blood products. Um, so uh, adjuncts, uh, what are the purpose of these? So there's a lot of different adjuncts that are available out there for resuscitation. And like I talked about some of the lab measurements. So why should we even bother with any of these? Well, as we already talked about, there's two different kinds of coagulopathy that can occur here. And so what we've found out is that even if you give somebody whole blood or plasma, they can still have a coagulopathy. It seems to be better than if they got crystalloid, but it can still be there. So the question is, can we determine the cause of that during their resuscitation and act on it sooner? So uh, there's really sort of two main uh, viscoelastic or coagulation analyzers on the market. One is the TEG, one is the Rotem. Uh, and um, right now, these are typically available just in the hospital. Uh, multiple studies have been done on these that on the whole typically show that there is some improvement uh, in outcomes either with decreased blood products, case control, survival, multiple organ failure. Um, this is uh, one of the earlier papers on looking at uh, use of TAG, and this is done before they started doing in empiric one-to-one -one MTP, but they found that there's no difference in blood trauma. However, those who had penetrating trauma had a significant improvement in their survival by about 20%. Uh, this is Eddie Gonzalez's paper, uh, prospective randomized uh, control trial, looking at 111 patients with TEG versus standard MTP and saw an improvement in survival in those who got TEG-guided resuscitation. Uh, there's lots of pros and cons to using these things. So um, the pros are that, you know, there are lots of retrospective and one prospective trial, so that there's improved outcomes. Uh, but you do have to have viscoelastic analyzer. You have to have interpretation capabilities. Currently, it's still in hospital only. Um, so we're still out there. I, I, I am certain that as technology improves, now these are, you know, they used to be vial-based. Now they're becoming cartridge-based. It won't be too long before y'all have these in your rig. You'll be able to take a, a finger stick, blood, pop it in the cartridge, pop it in the um, machine, and it's going to tell you what type of blood uh, component resuscitation they need. Um, I will say, having uh, developed an entire program for this for Parkland and UT Southwestern uh, and used it over the past uh, 12, 15 years, uh, these are typically easier to do in the ICU, meaning focus on the basics, stop the hemorrhage, hypertensive resuscitation, whole blood or component therapy. And then if there is a coagulopathy after you've started those, then you can address it then when the chaos of resuscitation is not so severe. Uh, lots of pharmacologic adjuncts come on the market. Uh, when I was a resident, it was um, uh, factor seven uh, was the was the um, was the 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 adjunct du jour. Then it's progesterone. Now it's TXA PCCs uh, starting with the TAP trial. 
and fibrinogen concentrate won't be too far along. Oops. So let's talk about TXA. That's probably the most popular one and the one that's most commonly uh, available right now. It was made popular by the CRASH-2 trial. Uh, we could spend an entire hour debating the merits of that study. It's been evaluated in lots of other uh, retrospective studies. Uh, most of them typically some, show some type of benefit. Interestingly, though, most of them don't show a hemorrhage control benefit. Um, and so uh, it probably has something to do with the anti-inflammatory effects of TXA. But that is still actually being elucidated. Uh, there's still some concerns about the potential effects. And that concern is what we talked about earlier. If you have the accelerated clot breakdown, you have hemorrhagic death. If you have slow clot breakdown or no clot breakdown, you have increased mortality from multiple organ failure and sepsis later on. So um, we're not exactly sure just yet. Now the study, some, some of the studies have come out and said, hey, we don't really see this, but they're also not powered to look for that. So uh, that is still a hypothetical concern for this. Uh, in our impaired therapy, um, if you give TXA, we know we're going to treat uh, overtreat hyperfibrinolysis. It's going to have that anti-inflammatory benefit that we know. Uh, it may institute some shutdown. Uh, if you want to say like, hey, I'm just going to give TXA if I know they have hyperfibrinolysis, you're going to have to have that equipment. You're going to have to have a protocol to know when to treat it. Uh, you may miss out on some of that anti-inflammatory benefit. And we know that you have the high probability of overshooting and still causing that shutdown, hypothetically. Uh, fibrinogen concentrate. Uh, sounds like a great idea. You know, let's give them some, you know, if they're breaking down a lot of that fibrin, let's give them some more. Uh, 26 studies have been done looking at this, five randomized tri trials. There was no difference in mortality, um, no difference in the transfusion volumes. Unfortunately, though, uh, these studies are pretty low quality data with lots of risk of bias and precision and inconsistency. So I tell you, in my opinion, the jury's still out on use of uh, fibrinogen and concentrate. Um, pretty much same for uh, prothrombin complex concentrates. Uh, most commonly is four-factor K-Cintra. Uh, there's been 17 observational studies looking at uh, PCC. Uh, only four of them have been done in trauma. Uh, the entire cohort, there's no association, association with improved mortality. Um, PCC plus F, FFP, uh, was associated with the reduced mortality in one of the studies. Uh, there is a new, very, very large multi-center, multi-institutional uh, trial called the TAP trial, which is going to be looking at this. And so we will see what the results of that study are. Um, question will often come up uh, in these folks, like what about those who are peri-arrest who are actually arrest? When you're in a rural center, let's say you're the peri-arrest, taking the nearest hospital, it's a level four trauma center, uh, and they arrest as soon as you get there. Should a resuscitative thoracotomy be done? Um, when we talk about resuscitative thoracotomy, if we remember the things I talked about earlier about things that increase coagulopathy, which are tissue damage and hemorrhage, I can assure you that resuscitative thoracotomy significantly increases the tissue damage and significantly increases the hemorrhage, whether or not it was there to begin with or not. We have now added to that. Uh, so you get blood loss, heat loss, a lot of this tissue injury, and it causes a very significant metabolic burden. Um, and if you do get return of circulation, then what are you going to do? If there's no surgeon, you can't send a patient with their chest open and a clamp on their aorta. That's not going to work. Uh, so what options do exist? And this is where the discussion of the Reboa catheter comes in. So this isn't really a new concept. In the 50s, there was published about using uh, a intra-arterial balloon occlusion device uh, to be able to stem hemorrhage in injured war fighters. Uh, it took, in, the Japanese were using it uh, actually probably the first and early on. And then we started, uh, we started sending people over to learn how to do it. And then uh, in 2016, that was one of the big early papers looking at uh, endovascular occlusion of the aorta versus resuscitative thoracotomy and saw that um, there was a comparable and potentially decreased uh, mortality rate. And then in one of the um, Japanese studies, looks at favoring Reboa over open thoracotomy. So this really started driving the use of uh, Reboa 
uh, across the country. Now, the indications for this are non-compressible hemorrhage below the diaphragm, shock or impending, I should say impending arrest. Um, the idea is they can be placed in the ED or an angio and then cross the pond in London. Some people are going to be placed in a free hospital. Um, they should never be placed in patients where there's major thoracic injuries because if you might imagine if you increase that free occlusion aortic pressure and causes a rupture there, that doesn't work very well. Same for neck or uh, axillary injuries. Um, once it's in there, how long can we leave it in? Well, we don't really know. Uh, I tell you about 60 minutes, uh, we start seeing a significant increase in the inflammatory uh, markers of ischemia. Um, and in swine and pig models at 60 minutes, we start seeing uh, paralysis occur in uh, about 12 and a half percent of the patient uh, pigs. The Reboa company is trying to overcome some of this with what they call the partial Reboa. So if you imagine the original blow, you blow up the balloon, includes the aorta completely. This one is a semi-permeable membrane, which allows some of that blood to percolate through there. So if you imagine uh, in the old uh, uh, modality here, you blow up the balloon, the distal blood pressure after that aorta is going to be zero, right? And no blood flow. The new one, as supposed to allow for proximal occlusion, but also allow, if you want to, you can allow some blood to pump through there, or if you want to blow it all the way up completely occluded, you can do that too. Um, some of the very early preliminary data looking at this is showing that um, uh, partial occlusion can be done uh, with a partial BOA, um, and the acute kidney injury is significantly less, uh, and some potential for decreased mortality. Um, this is where I was going to say there's a study that just came out in England looking at uh, a, a randomized study looking at Reboa and did not show any uh, improvement in mortality and actually in a subset of patients showed some increase in harm. So there is a large, very large debate about Reboa. My personal take on Reboa is I do think that there is a patient population that probably can benefit from this. Uh, I think a partial occlusion Reboa is a better modality to uh, allow some distal perfusion uh, in these patients who are in severe, uh, severe hemorrhagic shock. Uh, I do think that it requires a significant amount of training and ongoing training uh, in order to maintain a skill set. Uh, this isn't one something you can learn once and then two years later be comfortable placing it. I don't think that's a good idea at all. And I know this because the first several, we were an early adopter in Dallas and we had pretty significant complications in the first several we picked. And somewhere I've got a picture of me and the surgeon who was the TMD at the time placing the very first Reboa. And he's putting it on. We were at a con we were at our standard conference that or trauma conference that morning. So we're in our suit and ties with the yellow gowns on. He's got sterile gloves placing this line. I've got the directions uh, standing there next to him, reading him out the directions on how to place that. And so uh, we had a few complications early on, which then led, led us to having a standard training program for placing that. And once we had that standard training program in place, then our complications all but disappeared. So like I said, I think there is a possibility for use, um, but it, it, it's a limited population. Um, so when you have a bleeding patient, first and foremost, do what you can to stop the bleeding. Know what your adjuncts are, know what you have available to you. Do you have tourniquets? Do you have hemostatic gauze? Do you have splints? Do you have binders? Do you have big splints? Do you have industrial splints? Just the cardboard box tape block. What do you have, what's available to you? And what can you use in that pre-hospital arena as you're getting the patient to the hospital? Um, the next generation of Reboa is you may, and the reason I go over this, people are like, well, why are we doing this? We are gonna put them in the pre-hospital phase? Uh, probably not, however, I do foresee a possibility where, let's say you're air medical and you get called to pick up somebody at level four, they may have a Reboa in them. And so as you're, and as you're transferring them to the level one, you should have some knowledge of what this thing is, what it looks like, et cetera. So that's why I think it's important to go over this sort of stuff now. Uh, I don't think it's ready for prime time just yet, but we're getting uh, closer to knowing that data. Um, that pre-hospital hemorrhage control is critical for all those things I said. What y'all can do in the field can make a significant difference in what I deal with in the operating room. 
right? It really is this continuum of care. And so what y'all do there so it can really significantly help me out. Pre-hospital transfusions are viable. You can do it. They do improve outcomes. We're not exactly sure on every venue that they do improve outcomes. Like I said, Air Medical, data seems pretty clear that does help. Ground transport, we're still working on. I don't think it's really air versus ground. I think it's transport time is really the main difference there. Always be very, very thoughtful about the resuscitation conduct. If you can limit the crystalloids, then do so. Don't just pour fluids in there to try to get a normal blood pressure. Titrate that to a palpable radial pulse. Use the products that are available to you. Prioritize your blood, your coagulation chain fluids first. Low, tighter, whole blood. If you have it, great, use that. If you don't, use plasma. Um, if you don't, use crystalloids. That's just it. Um, and then always remember the fourth and probably the most critical resuscitation fluid is diesel. Go fast, get them out of that environment, get them to definitive care. Um, and then long transport air prioritized plasma or whole blood. Uh, there are multiple large clinical trials ongoing. Currently, they're underway. Uh, it, my belief and actually hope that if I were to give the same talk next year, I would have to redo the majority of these slides to update it with new and improved data. Uh, so with that, uh, I'll say thank you. Um, and true to my word, if you have a pen available, I'm going to give you all my cell phone number right now. So that if y'all ever have an issue or concern about something, I want you all to feel clear, hot, to give me a text or call whenever you want. So that number is area code 510-851-2291. And that's a sincere offer to all of you. If you ever have a question about something, somebody gives you some grief over something that happened, well, let me know. I am happy to advocate on y'all's behalf because I can't do my job without y'all. Uh, and I am always, always just impressed and overwhelmed with what y'all are able to do out in the environment. So I thank you uh, for what y'all do also. And with that, I'm happy to answer any questions y'all have. There is, uh, thank you so much. There is a question in the chat. Are you able to see that? Yeah, it says, are very real areas going to be required to carry blood at some point in the future? So fantastic question. Maybe, but here's what I think is probably going to be the more likely first scenario, because, you know, blood is a scarce resource and it can't be just stored everywhere. And uh, because of it is, and it passes expiration date, it's got to be wasted. And so we don't want to waste that scarce resource. So uh, what will probably be happen is, and I'll just use Anschutz because that's where I work. What will probably happen is Anschutz will have the blood storage capability here or in our very near central aeromedical uh, areas here so that in the very very rural areas what will happen is we will bring the blood to the patient there so they'll be resuscitated with the best that whatever it is that you can resuscitate them with so let's say there's you got two units of packed red cells and that's it give them the two units of packed red cell give them crystalloid titrate that that uh, blood pressure to systolic at 90. Uh, Helo shows up and first phase will be, they will probably have whole blood or plasma to start resuscitating that patient, bring them back to level one. Second phase would be that a Helo would show up with whole blood or plasma and adjuncts and some sort of coagulation analyzer. So they'd be able to pick up and be like, oh, okay, cool. This person ha needs more uh, PC. They, they have some factor deficiencies. Great. We'll give them a shot of PCC and we're off and running. That's the future. That's where we're headed to. So I don't know necessarily that very, very rural areas will be required to carry blood. I think probably what will happen is if, if the data bears out that things like Reostat or PCC, things that have a very long shelf life can show some benefit, my guess is that's what would be prioritized. Uh, at these very austere environments. So I like, hey, you know, we got this, you know, fibrinogen concentrate will sit on the shelf for three years. Cool. Uh, you get that one patient in three years, they come in, you give them two units of red cells, hit them with that two grams of rheostat, helo shows up, they're So that's what I think is probably the future, not 
mandating blood storage in rural environments. What else y'all want to know? I'm happy to talk about this stuff all day, and and there is no question that uh, I'd be like, what? I have a question for you. So, you know, permissive hypotension, do we have right. like a, do we have any data on a time limit for that? So some folks on here have transport times of at least 30 minutes to the nearest hospital that has, you know, a couple of ER beds and uh, kind of limited resources. Do you know how long you can have permissive hypotension? Yeah, it, pretty much as long as it takes to get to your definitive care. Um, and so, um, I, I wouldn't worry about the time frame on that. Like, just try to keep it around ninety. So, one of the stories I have uh, on this, um, and I and I've been tinkering with permissive hypotension for twenty years. Um, so, I had a guy when I was in Dallas who was robbing a house like at six a.m. Just a you know, terrible idea robbing houses to begin with, and definitely don't do it in Texas because you know what happened. That guy got shot. I am by the owner, just sitting there waiting for him to crawl through the window. Dink. So this guy comes in with a uh, missile wound, sort of right here in his chest, and a huge hematoma, and no pulse in his right arm, and his blood pressure was about sixty when he showed up. But he was awake and talking. Um, well, kind of hollering, but he was awake. All right. And so what I said was, "Cool, he's awake." Let's get some IV access. Do not intubate him. Uh, we didn't have whole blood in Parkland. So I gave, I said, let's give, order the MTP. But I said, I want to give one um, red. So one pack of red cells and then one pack of FFP. And I just want to alternate those. And I do not want you to shove it in and jam it in. And so his blood pressure would go up to like about, you know, 98, maybe 100, drift back down to 80, back up to about 100. And it would just kind of oscillate. And I'm like, great. And he was awake and he wasn't fighting everybody. He wasn't trying to punch. So I'm like, hey, you just be calm and don't. So we didn't intubate him because when you do that, you drop their vascular tone and then you drop their blood pressure. So I'm like, no. So he kept his blood pressure about 890. I sat there and watched him for a little while in the unit in the resuscitation room. He was doing that fine that way. So I went to the scanner. So it's what we call a high profile maneuver. Uh, you got somebody with, you know, an arterial injury, but you take them a scanner, but one red, one yellow, one red, one yellow. So I had a subclavian artery injury. Went by now, it's daytime, vascular surgery's there. I had vascular surgeons come in the OR. We were in the OR and we did an endovascular stent across his subclavian artery. And I never intubated the guy until vascular had a proximal balloon occlusion of the subclavian artery. And his pressure shot up to 120. And then we intubated him. Because now we have proximal control. And that whole, the reason I told that very long, dull story is that it took us a good solid hour to get all that stuff ready and get to that spot. And the whole time, it was one red, one yellow, oscillated between 180 the whole time. And I was fine with it. And he left the hospital in three days, straight to jail, but he still left the hospital. <laughs> Let's see here. Um, transport is 45 and 45. Oh, yep. Yeah. Cool. Do your best you can. All right. Um, the, the, the biggest problem I see is when you have these long transports and people are really, and the patient is, you know, bleeding and people are trying to jam that BP up to 120. Don't. Now, if you're, some people ask, well, what about pressor use? Okay. I'm okay with pressors, but remember, pressors are not resuscitative fluids. They are not. If you need to give the crystalloid and you're given on, that's all you've got, fantastic, give it. Their blood pressure is still 60 at best. You want to try to push that perfusion for the heart and the brain. You want to give them suppressive, that's okay. You know, the, then you just got to go as fast as you can. And I will do everything I can to fix the coagulopathy and all that sort of stuff on the other side. What I hate to see is people come in like, hey, we got their blood pressure up to, you know, 120. They're on no fluids, but they're on an epi drip. I'm like, nah, no, no, wrong way. Flip it around. I'd rather get the fluids. Uh, TXA is a substitute for blood within long transport times in trauma patients. Uh, so when you survey trauma patients, you're going to get two distinct categories. The very pro-TXA and the very anti-TXA. I like to think I'm in the middle. Um, 
I do not think TXA should be given in lieu of resuscitative fluids and prioritizing coagulation containing resuscitative fluids over that. Um, when you go through and you look at the data, yes, TXA probably helps, but if you look really closely, there's not a whole lot of difference in the resuscitative fluids given to those patients. It's probably more of an anti-inflammatory component there. We're especially seeing that in TBI patients. In the mild to moderate TBI, we're seeing improvement with TXA. Again, it's not stopping the hemorrhage. It's producing, it's inhibiting the secondary inflammatory response, which we go back to that nerd slide where I said coagulation and inflammation is this very, very large intricate interactum. So that's probably where the TXA is because it's inhibiting the conversion of plasminogen to plasmin. Plasmin is a very potent chemotactic for all the bad sorts of um, uh, biochemical molecules in the body. So I don't mind it, especially for the TBI. I don't think like, hey, this person is hemorrhaging. I'm going to give them a couple of slugs of TXA. And ha ha, we saved them. And that's not what's going to happen. So I would not think of it that way. What else y'all want to know? Whole blood is good, I think. Um, it's interesting that we have to keep relearning this and having to keep doing multiple trials on it. But my answer has always been, and my joke is the same thing, like, hey, doc, look at all this platelets that are pouring out of me. Like, no, it's not what happened. Like, pack red cells and kind of like, a whole blood pours out of you. So we should probably be working on doing that. San Antonio has a really good pre-hospital uh, blood transfusion program. Uh, I'm working with Angie Wright here. We're going to be working on that in Colorado to try to get us some uh, better transfusions um, uh, here for the pre-hospital arena. Um, like I said, I don't think we will. I went to South Dakota last year. They have a pretty good model there where there's a central blood repository and then that shipped on the aeromedical and pick people up and then come back. Don't ever let me give you any grief. If you ever put a pelvic binder on, put a tourniquet on. If they say, hey, this wasn't quite on correct, then learn, see where they give you some advice on where to put it. But if anybody ever says, don't do that, you tell them to call me because you guys do an amazing job out there. And I really think those things help. Anyone got any more questions before? Another no time. <laughs> Just remember to email ryan.shelton at uchealth.org for your CEs. And I do have a message from Steve Reidquist who lost power, but he wanted to express his gratitude. Phenomenal presentation, phenomenal in all capitals. So thank you. <laughs> oh, it's my pleasure. Really happy. Anytime I can do anything to help you all out, you just let me know. <laughs> Going once? Going twice? All right. Thanks. I appreciate you. Thank you, Dr. Gibbs. Have a good day. All right. See you all later.